Yeah, welcome back for our final uh, roundtable discussion. Um, I'm really looking forward to hearing from our three speakers who I think are going to give us a really... Uh, I think people are coming in still, but uh, we'll just start. Um, so really looking forward to hearing our three speakers who I think will give us a really um, personal um, and unique three different perspectives on the theme that we have, putting forgiveness and compassion into action. So first we have Tom Williams, and um, it's probably fair to say that um, most of us were inspired yesterday to hear um, Mayor Fisher talking about how he's transforming uh, Louisville, Kentucky into the most compassionate city in the world. But one of the things that you probably haven't gathered yet is that uh, Tom is integral part of that, of that initiative. He's, um, he's one of the guys doing huge, uh, amazing work behind the scenes. Uh, one of the allies that Mayor Fisher has uh, up his sleeve to uh, carry out all this work in Louisville. Um, Tom is uh, a lawyer by profession. Uh, he's the founder of Restorative Justice uh, Louisville, and now it's uh, board chair. Uh, and I'm told that Mayor Fisher calls him a lawyer with the heart of a mystic. So we're looking forward to hearing from him. And then next we'll be hearing from uh, Sujatha Balaga, our second speaker. Uh, she also has a legal background. Uh, she's been a victim advocate and a public defender. And she used a Soros Justice Fellowship to build a successful restorative justice program uh, for young people. She's now director of the Restorative Justice Project at the National Council on Crime and Delinquency. Uh, and she's dedicated to using restorative justice to end child sexual abuse and violence in the United States and South Asia. And last but not least, on the end, we have uh, Professor Stephen Goodman, who's a leading light in the world of Buddhist studies and learning. Uh, he's research and program director and core faculty for Asian and Comparative Studies at the California Institute of Integral Studies. Uh, he's lectured on Buddhist and Comparative Philosophy for over 30 years uh, in the United States, Asia, and Europe, and he's a specialist on Tibetan Buddhism. So looking forward to hearing from him uh, too. But maybe, Tom, if you'd like to begin. Thanks for being here today. Uh, before Louisville was a compassionate city, we called ourselves Possibility City. And when a lawyer leads the compassion effort, you know that is true. <laughs> so um, I'm delighted to be here today. And uh, as head of the partnership, or one of the hosts of partnership uh, for Compassionate Louisville, our mission is to nurture and champion the growth of compassion. And we keep this great open-ended question in front of us. Uh, what does compassion want for Louisville? And what I've seen in my experience in working with Compassion for the last few years is that it's not like my money. If I give away my money, it goes away. But if I give away my compassion, it grows. So we, I really love this aspect of compassion is that, you know, it grows by giving it away. So one thing we say to every other city that wants to get involved is we're as committed to your success as we are, as we are to our own, and that please give us an opportunity to share anything we have. So anything that we've learned since getting started on this journey, we'd be glad to share with other city organizers because it really uh, benefits us. The other thing I like to tell people is, I mean, the other day somebody leaned at, back to me and said, the mayor, you, you have a great boss in the mayor. And I always correct people and say, I don't work for the mayor because I don't. I'm a volunteer. I've done this all on a volunteer basis. Uh, I work for Compassion. And we invite people in Louisville to go to work for Compassion because uh, for me, working for Lady Compassion is one of my favorite things to do. I treat her like a client, and I, um, she hasn't paid me well, but um, she's <laughs> paid me with, with good heart uh, types of things. Uh, so the other thing I like to talk about for me is that I think, you know, they talk about movements, but for me, compassion is more of a stillness. I think there's been so many wonderful practices today of uh, stilling ourselves and quieting ourselves so we can move out from a place of... Um, of stillness. So I like to tell people that we're, this, we're not a movement, we're just removing obstacles so you can find your center and find your own still point. Uh, but for me personally, how did I get here? Uh, I was, um, you know, Thomas Merton likes to say, you know, a horrible thing is to 
climb the ladder of success and find that your ladder is on the wrong wall. Well, that's pretty much where I was in uh, 2007. I was president of the Bar Association and actually did a lovely trip here to San Francisco and went to none of the sessions, but visited Muir Woods and had all kinds of great, great times while I was there. But one of the things that I was doing at that point in my life was a, a lay witnessing uh, process in my church with other men in a safe space. And it was really this chance to deal with my shadow resume, which is actually bigger than my actual resume. It's, I've got a very big shadow resume. And there's a lot of um, real power and strength in the shadow. And one thing that I found during this process was um, uh, there was a mentor that I loved dearly um, and a client, and he was uh, about to die, and we did a deathbed will with him, and I'd never talked to somebody who's about to die. And I had no idea what I'd do. And when we got there, I ended up just crying with him, which was just, uh, in my mind at the time, so completely inappropriate and unprofessional, right? I mean, then you, lawyers don't cry is kind of the mantra. Uh, later at that time, I found a spiritual director, and he, told, he gave me this great permission, which was just one of the most lovely things, because I was crying all the time, and I still cry all the time. But he said, did you, did you know in, in our tradition, I'm Catholic, that for the Desert Fathers, um, Tears are a spiritual gift. Yeah. And, excuse me, what I've learned is that um, when I'm in the presence of the Spirit, I often cry, right? I mean, because the Spirit is, um, it's a very palpable thing. So this mentor, we did a I did a deathbed will with him, and what happened was um, he was supposed to die in a day or two, but he ends up dying like a week and a half later, and I dreamt he called me the night he died. I didn't, pay, I didn't answer the phone, but I dreamt he called me, and we checked. And, you know, it, the world is a very ironic place, isn't it? This morning, his daughter runs his business, and I was talking to her out on the ledge, talking about some legal issues for him. So that was in 2006. Then in 2007, um, I was having a series of synchronicities, and it ended in... Um, a dream in September of 2007. I dreamt the managing partner in my law firm died. And I've shared this story with him, so I'm not kind of out of school with this. Um, but, uh, and I went into work the next day, and he didn't die, but his dad died, who has the same name as him. And uh, uh, the reading in the church that day, excuse me, Um, the reading in the church that day was you can't serve both God and money. And um, sorry. Yeah, take it and um, you know, I'd been serving money, right? Um, I'd not been serving God. And you know, that was really where I started what I referred to as my walkabout. I didn't have any idea where I was going, um, but I just knew, knew I needed to move someplace because it was really, um, well, the other, the other piece of that was I was batting two for two on these death dreams, and um, I had this intuition that I was going to die real soon. And so I lived in that small percentage that today is today, but um, one of the beautiful things, one of the beautiful lines from St. Francis is about sister death. And he says, keep sister death close because she'll change your priorities. And, and she really changed my priorities and sent me on a different direction. Uh, one of the things that I've really connected with and one of the storylines that we built in Louisville is Thomas Merton's Epiphany in Fourth and Walnut. It's Fourth and Ali now. And Mayor Fisher referenced it in his um, inaugural address. And I was fortunate to be part of a group that named it Thomas Merton Square, and uh, we have a historic marker. And I brag all the time that how many cities have a historic marker to a mystical revelation? We think we might be the only ones, because we're big braggers in Louisville, you can tell that. Um, <laughs> but I was um, involved with that, and one of my spiritual directors, what he was talking to me about was, was um, uh, about transformation of consciousness and then how Carl Jung was speaking that consciousness needed to move from a three to a four. So three being competition and striving and four being contemplation and compassion and all those wonderful aspects. And um, when working with Merton and his epiphany, it's really this beautiful thing because he went 
to uh, the monastery to find God, and ironically, he found God in the hearts of the people of Louisville, Kentucky. They were walking around shining like the sun. And he ends the epiphany with this great line, the gate of heaven is everywhere, meaning that you know, he expected to walk into heaven in the monastery, but he somehow found, found it there in that street corner. And I, I'm kind of re like Rasputin to the mayor, so you have, you know, he has a lot he has to put up with. But I pointed out to the mayor that if consciousness needs to move from a three to a four, isn't it interesting that Merton's epiphany was on the fourth street in the fourth district of what's now Fourth Street Live of Louisville, Kentucky? It's a very lovely uh, bit. And then the other bit is that on the 50th anniversary of the, the epiphany, the sort of Pentecostal anniversary, right, the 50th, um, we did a dedication of the location. And the plan was for the councilman to unveil the sign, but what actually happened was while the abbot was blessing the location with his hands up, the wind blew the sign off. And I later have told people that, you know, a better Pentecostal symbol would have been if it caught on fire, but it didn't. <laughs> we'll take the wind. So the wind blew it off and the, ne the paper literally reported the next day that it, the wind blew it off before Councilman Tandy could unveil it. And I sent him an errata. I said, actually the wind blew it off while the abbot was blessing the location. And I told the councilman that the location was dedicated by a power higher than Metro Council, thankfully. Um, but you know, part of my mystical vision on this was that, you know, at this point in my life, I experienced a pre two precognitive dreams that were very profound for me. And um, um, it really fed me this notion that um, maybe Thomas Merton saw us, you know. Um, Maybe, why not Louisville? Um, you know, why not Louisville? Why, why not? And I've later learned that um, the site of the epiphany for the indigenous people was sacred ground, which is not surprising to me. But I guess what I'll end with is that um, anything we have, we'll share with you, and that every city has a storyline like this. Every city has a Thomas Merton Square. Um, and. and and everyone can go to work for compassion, and, and aren't we all very blessed to be able to do so? So thank you. So it's wonderful to be on the panel with both of these wonderful gentlemen, um, and I have connections to both of them and their work in different ways, but um, I had the honor of being Louisville last year, I guess, and I work on a report for the federal government's Office of Victims of Crime, uh, surveying the nation for uh, the best culturally responsive, victim-oriented, restorative justice programs. And we sent out a national survey to hundreds and hundreds of organizations, and we chose seven for site visits nationally. And the restorative justice program that this gentleman was instrumental in creating happened to be one of those sites we didn't meet then, but we got to meet now, so this was really great. Um, so a little bit about the work I do, restorative justice, uh, the words that people know, and, and these days uh, everything's getting called restorative justice, and that usually happens when there's some funding attached to a thing. Um, my boss jokes, he says, this is Sujata, she runs our, that's not restorative justice program. <laughs> um, because I, I love to say, you know, your, your gang tattoo removal program is wonderful, that's not quite restorative justice. Or, it's great that you're building gardens in your city, I'm not sure why you're calling that restorative justice. So what, what is restorative justice? And my mentor and uh, dear friend Howard Zare, who is called the grandfather of restorative justice, helps us think about restorative justice from a paradigm shift perspective. And I use uh, the same Einstein quote that Dr. Kim does in my PowerPoints, uh, which is about, um, you know, about changing the way we're thinking. We, if, if we want to solve a problem, we can't solve it if we're thinking the same way we're, we were thinking when we created it. And this is really important, particularly in a participatory democracy that we own, that our legal systems, our criminal legal system, our juvenile legal system, um, our school to prison pipeline, and all of its attendant racial and ethnic disparities, and the ways in which it really fails everyone, including our crime victims, was something that we created. And while that can feel really daunting, it can also feel really um, hopeful because we can change the way we were thinking and create something else, something new, maybe something also very old, something that comes from all of our indigenous roots. Um, and so, um, so what's, that, what's that paradigm shift we're called to? Today, when we're confronted with crime and harm, uh, we tend to think what law was broken, who broke it, how do we punish them? In the school's context, that's you know what rule was broken, who broke it, 
How do we punish them? That's the general paradigm that we're in today, a very punitive paradigm. The shift that restorative justice calls us to is a very different set of questions. It starts with who's been harmed, what do they need, and whose obligation is it to meet those needs? So if we were just asking those first two questions, who is harmed and what do they need, that's what we should all be doing anytime we're confronted with something terrible that happens to anyone. My dog is in the process of transitioning and I'm getting tons of texts from my friends saying, what do you need, what do you need, you know, how are you, how are you feeling, you know, how are you hurting, what do you need? Um, and that's great. Now, if this were something that something had happened to me where there was an obligation involved, that third question is what makes it a justice paradigm, right? Whose obligation is it to meet those needs? And the overall picture then is crime is a violation of people and interpersonal relationships, not primarily the state. The state may have a role, but it's primarily people and interpersonal relationships. Those violations create obligations, and the central obligation is to make it right, to do right by the folks you've harmed. Um, and the obligation of communities is to support both sides, if there is really a side in a circle, um, to, to make it right, uh, to heal and move forward. So that has lots of different applications in the real world, and most of these applications come from indigenous processes uh, that I've learned from peacemaking circles uh, that we call circle process, and the Maori uh, have an amazing model called family group conferencing, which is the primary model that I work with, uh, which was born of the Maori discontent with the racial and ethnic disparities in their communities uh, at the rate at which their children were being locked up in New Zealand, and so that's what drew us in Oakland to looking at this. I was working with a wonderful organization at the time called Restorative Justice for Oakland Youth uh, that turns into RJOY, which I think is a great uh, acronym for an organization working with young people who've done harm. Um, and, and what we do is, we, what we did was we created programs in both the schools and the juvenile justice context in which kids get to meet face to face with their crime victims learn through direct contact with their crime victim. How were they harmed and what do they need? What an empowering set of questions for the crime victim, right? Uh, to define the harm themselves, not by some statute, not by some lawmakers, but by their own lived experience. Young people having the opportunity to learn and sit and listen, and then collectively come up with a plan to repair that harm. When that harm is repaired, no one's ever charged with a crime. Nobody has to go through the expulsion process at a school, right? So this is the way we'd like to see us revolutionize the way in which we think about wrongdoing in this country. So a little bit about how I came to this work. So, so basically what I do today is I run around the state and the country trying to help jurisdictions uh, replicate that. And a lot of the healing that needs to be done actually is between the organizations that would like to facilitate these processes and the state actors that would need to refer the cases to this, right? So we have to do as grown-ups what we are asking young people uh, to do um, first. And so we do a lot of healing processes uh, with, with, within those communities as well. It's wonderful. So how I came to the work. Um, when I was in college, I was a victim advocate, and after college, I was doing victim advocacy with uh, sexually abused and exploited children and battered women in shelters and in other contexts, and I moved to uh, India for uh, some time to help my then boyfriend start a school for the children of uh, HIV positive, um, what I was calling at the time sex workers and quickly realized were slaves, um, who had been abducted from primarily Nepal, and the work was really, basically it was killing me when I would call sort of like empathy burnout um, or over resonance in a sense with what I was experiencing with the people uh, that I was trying to help. I was very ineffective and had been probably for the last year of the work that I've been doing in my early 20s. And it was because I was doing what I think of as trauma mastery, you know, trying to work out through my work what I really needed to be working out within myself, which was my own uh, experiences as a child uh, growing up in rural Pennsylvania being sexually abused in my home by my father. And so this, um, this was an extremely uh, painful realization that I had not done the work on myself sufficient to be able to do this work. And I kind of packed up my stuff and I took off. I left uh, my partner and I left the work uh, that I wasn't really doing to begin with. And, 
landed uh, up, I went backpacking in the Himalaya, and I, I ended up in Dharamshala, um, and through a wonderful and strange uh, set of events, ended up being encouraged by a family who had taken an interest in me. Imagine in the early 1990s, this, uh, someone in her early 20s, uh, with an American accent, and wearing kurtas and jeans, and running around backpacking in India, I mean, the Tibetan families were like, what, what are you, and <laughs> what are you doing here? Um, and so people took an interest in me, and, and I learned a lot about forgiveness from them in their own journeys of, of uh, escaping Tibet. And I, um, Chinese occupied Tibet. And I, I was starting to try to figure out how would that apply to my own life. And someone said, you should write a letter to his holiness and ask him. And so I was, I was um, you know, I was like, well, I'm sure he's busy, you know. <laughs> so, but I did end up penning a note and left it at his monastery on someone's uh, continued uh, insistence. And, and I couldn't name my own uh, issues at that time, I simply said, anger is killing me, but it fuels my work. How do you work on behalf of abused and oppressed people, especially when it's your own people, right? Without anger as the motivating force. So it turns out he had a trip that was canceled the following week and I was offered a private audience with him. So here I am in my early 20s, uh, you know, um, and uh, having an hour uh, with his holiness. Uh, and during that hour, I shared for the first time in my life uh, the degree to which I carried this confused heart, in a sense. I both hated my father so much and had wished for his death, and then when he died, when I was 16, by some strange impulse, I did CPR on my dying father. Um, and I blamed myself for that, and many therapists had pathologized it in the years that followed as Stockholm Syndrome, or uh, this one was my favorite, a failure to individuate based on my over-identification with my Indian culture. <laughs> but you know, what I think that I realized over the years was that what it, what, as I learned more about restorative justice, was it was this notion of Ubuntu, I am because we are. And that is most literally true in the case of children, right? And the way in which we relate to our families. I am because we are. And, uh, or this notion of mui, which I am really loving this word mui that I learned yesterday, right? So, um, so, so for me, um, His Holiness really was the physical embodiment of compassion, the way in which he engaged with me. I have never experienced anything like this. And in some ways I think my trajectory changed because he, I think he rewired me in his contact with me and the way he held my hand and he wiped away my tears I and mean, it was an unbelievable experience. And, and the first question he asked when I said, you know, I'm tired of, of, of this, I want to forgive my father, tell me how to forgive my father. And the first question he asked me was, have you been, do you feel you have been angry long enough? That question was the first time someone had genuinely asked me a question about my own healing journey, that the answer could have been anything and he would have been okay with it. I really felt that. And so I surveyed anger's impact on my life and I said, yes, I am done. This is not serving me anymore. So he gave me two pieces of advice. The first was to meditate and, the, uh, and, I, and he said, you know, you should do an intensive meditation course. He said, you have a bright mind, but it's run amok by your rage. You need to rein it in. That's the first step. Uh, and the second step would be to in some way open your heart to your enemies, uh, consider their position and their needs, not justifying what they did, but in some way, open your heart. So I said, the meditation thing I could do, but the, the second thing I was laughing at him, I said, I'm about to go to law school to become a prosecutor to lock these people behind bars, I'm not opening my heart to anybody. And he, and he laughs and he starts tapping my knees. I go, he's okay, you, you just meditate, you just meditate. <laughs> so, I immediately signed up for a 10-day Vipassana sit, and at the, on the 10th day of that sit, I had a, during the teaching of the Metta Bhavana practice, I had a spontaneous experience of complete and total forgiveness of my father. So, um, sort of in closing, what I would say is really quickly, because uh, I've gone over my time, um, which is, um, so forgiveness is neither a prerequisite nor an expected outcome of restorative justice processes, but I see some version of what I would call forgiveness in about 70, 5% of the cases that I do, even if we don't name it as such. I see it as sort of a, an intra-individual shift, uh, letting go of anger, right, the right to retribution and revenge towards the person you perceive as harmed you, uh, situated in a particular context. Um, and I get to see that over and over and over again in, in restorative processes, uh, whether it be uh, 
you know, burglaries uh, or murder cases that I've had the honor of facilitating. So um, I really believe that restorative justice is sort of the new wave, or the wave of the future that is also the wave of the past, bringing back really an old fashioned model that is based in accountability. Um, and it's really grounded in these notions and principles of uh, interdependence and interconnectedness that are grounded in my faith journey. So um, I feel really blessed to be able to do this work. And I would ask people to ask yourselves, you know, when I left the practice of, of criminal law, I realized it was because neither as a victim's advocate nor as a public defender or capital defense attorney, which is what I was doing right before I came to restorative justice. In neither of those polarities or those extremes was I allowing my whole heart to flourish, right? I was living in this us, them, right, wrong, good, bad paradigm that didn't match how I felt in my soul. And, and I would just ask folks to, to give yourself some time and space in your lives to ask, uh, how can I bring that, my whole heart, to my work? That doesn't mean leaving your profession. Maybe it means shifting it. Um, but it's something that's possible and it's been possible in my life. Perhaps you can all uh, join in and as we conclude or we begin to conclude and imagine what um, compassionate karmic waves will emanate from this great collective being of heart and soul that we might invite here and now all the great wisdom and compassion ancestors who have motivated us, embraced us, and also invite into the circle those great wisdom and compassion pioneers and teachers and guides and mentors who still walk this earth. And invite into this circle now those in the future, those compassionate wisdom seedlings who will sprout and thrive, be nourished by their ancestors and the pioneers who are here. And in this great circle, imagine galactic gross happiness, universal cosmic gross happiness. And imagine that with that sort of inspiration that we can return over and over again to nurturing ourselves and connecting to source, connecting to spirit, connecting to soul. And perhaps from that stance of shelter, safe container, we might dare to take little steps in finding ways to be present with generous heart in ever more varied situations. We don't necessarily need to be heavily armored against the intensity of life. We don't have to consider that being human is simply risk management. We might imagine being buoyed up by forces, beings, inspirations, energies, and memories which reconnect us to delight, to joy, to levity, to courage. Segway. Um, my day job or night job is uh, trying to engender a sense of wonder in an increasingly marginalized field within the humanities, which is Asian and comparative studies. Yes, that Asian non-Eurocentric modes of being have great wisdom traditions and the sub-sub-niche niche of all of that, Buddhist and Tibetan Buddhist teachings, and that there is still great wisdom within the vast tropical rainforest of texts and transmissions which are alive today and encouraging people 
to explore if it, if it resonates with their nature, what the wisdom and compassion is that is embodied within those texts. My shadow CV, thank you for that term, Tom, um, includes uh, uh, for many years now um, um, conducting or co-being, interbeing, and compassion-based approaches to trauma and recovery. And um, I was uh, leading a workshop at Esalen, and two times uh, this fellow, an emergency room physician, came uh, to the workshop. And it's, it's a workshop. It's doing practice. And um, we said, why are you here? And he said, um, I'm in Wyoming, and I see a lot of gunshot uh, situations, many situations. And one day, this man, very gaunt, um, came in with the, the limp body of what we found out was his son. And he put the son down there. We determined the son was dead. And very quickly, uh, a chaplain uh, or woman, um, uh, a nun came and held the hand of this man, who by this time we had figured out had been the one who had either through chronic abuse or in an acute instance of misguided uh, concern or anger, actually caused the death of his son. So while the police were being summonsed, she sat with him, held his hand, and said to him, come, let us pray together for forgiveness. And he said, I'm here to see if I can find that place of forgiveness in my heart. Here's a forgiveness practice, we might imagine. The first line of it is, really. I think words are very powerful. Um, one can imagine saying or feeling, really, followed by, I am doing the very best I can. then the practice is to then listen to the responses of your heart in the silence after that. Really, I'm doing the very best I can. And you can imagine a wide variety of responses. Next line. And so is every living being. Pause. And this is true all the time. This is true at all times. And then pause and see how you feel. So this is kind of a way, very quick, but I think quite powerful, to um, see how, how dehydrated our spiritual immune system is. It's very simple. Uh, the great... Um, psychologist Virginia Satir talks about how full or empty we are of a sense of okayness or well-being. And uh, with compassion practice, I, we get a lot of people who were um, burned out, so-called compassion fatigue. So I think that care for caregivers, care for those who are doing social justice work, care for those who are mentoring others, um, it's as if we're all in an airplane and at any moment, it's part of risk management, um, we may, there may be a deflation in our actual altitude. And so the oxygen masks may come down and we're told, first put it on yourself because without that, you will not be so effective. And um, these are just brief ways in and I would like to conclude by thanking everyone who's here. Um, and may whatever has happened here in the last several days or week truly inspire you to um, consider that you're doing the very best you can. And from that, feeling that powerful urge to be with those who are also working to do the best they can 
in this brief, amazing interval known as being human and to not be too distraught with the demonic projections of what I do is not of use. There's so many people to be saved. If you need to be this way, then imagine that you are the incarnation of compassion, Avalokiteshvara, Guan Yin, deep listening. And in the story, and I'll conclude with this, um, Guan Yin was despairing that there were so many beings. Beings are infinite, I vow to save every one. And in that moment of hesitation, his or her um, teacher, radiant boundlessness, Amitabha, gave the greatest gift and provided him with 11 heads, a thousand arms. So keep care alive, don't despair, and hang out with those who inspire you. And what else is there? Thank you. We do have some time left, so I wondered if you'd like to ask each other some questions. And if we do have time to open it up after that, we, we will do that. Sujatha, could you um, share a, a restorative justice story that, uh, that's compelling to you? Oh, um, they're all compelling. Uh, whether or not people are simply satisfied that they were repaid for their cost of their lost car, whether or not people got answers to the questions that kept them up at night, what were my daughter's last words? Where's her body? Um, and we get, we get there with restorative justice, right? Um, but um, I would encourage folks to read an article that was in the New York Times January two, uh, 2013 called Can Forgiveness Play a Role in Criminal Justice? Uh, and it details a story about a, a teen dating violence case in Tallahassee, Florida, uh, that I had the honor of facilitating. Uh, and uh, it, it resulted in an amazing outcome uh, where the uh, parents of the young woman really did not want this young man to be charged with first degree murder, um, but rather wanted him to short, serve a shorter sentence and then ultimately uh, speak in high schools with them across uh, the state of Florida uh, about taking their daughter's life um, and, help, and becoming a voice for both restorative justice and, and ending teen dating violence. Um, and um, I mean, there are countless, countless situations. I think I'll, I'll tell a story about sort of the will we have now uh, amongst, I would say that uh, crime victims are far less punitive than we think they are on the whole. We have this notion that like, especially here in California, that there's a u unified voice of, of crime victims and that they're, they, that they're for tough on crime legislation. And, and what I see really is that when we start with the questions, how are you harmed and what do you need, um, that people aren't asking for prison <laughs> most of the time, rarely, rarely. What people are asking for are completely creative and wonderful and different things. And so it, it looks amazing in, in every circumstance. Um, and I feel honored to, to see um, people do right by the folks they've harmed um, over and over again. I think one of the things I love the best is when police officers come into the circle and, and share, oh, if I'd done that when I was a kid, <laughs> you know, I would have never had to go to prison for that, jail for that. Um, and to see, the, see places in communities where there's really bad police uh, youth relations start to heal themselves in the restorative process, that's, that wasn't the intended uh, piece of it, but you can see the ripple effects of it. Um, I think that's a piece of it. And um, yeah, just every one of them is, is remarkable, really. I'd love to see more and more politicians feel that they could uh, take the risk of being, uh, as seeing this accountability as actually being tough on crime. The outcomes often are tougher, uh, in a sense, when you have to sit in a circle with your own grandmother and confess what you've done um, and, and uh, hear the impact of your behavior on the people that you've harmed and, and really absorb that and, and process through that, I think, is, is tougher in many ways uh, than just sitting in a jail cell for a while. Yeah. Thank you. Tom, um, thank you for being in Louisville. Yep. Thank you for being Catholic. <laughs> this is said by a Unitarian. I once said I was a lapsed Unitarian to which a Catholic friend said, not very far to fall. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <clears throat> I have a lot of Unitarian jokes, but I won't tell any of them. Um, and my mother's brother was head of the Unitarian Universalist, so I'm 
that's fine. His praxis was writing uh, book reviews for the uh, various papers around his religious praxis. Um, I find that uh, Thomas Merton's um, work, his little book on spiritual exercises, and then perhaps for those who are under the thrall of Asian or Buddhist studies, his Asian journals have made quite an impact beyond um, his living presence. Um, now we have his eternal presence. And um, I think that there's a great, um, one talks of the communion of saints, and I imagine that he should be on the way to sainthood, even though he was quite controversial. And there's a great marriage of, um, I think, um, contemplative Catholic, contemplative traditions, and Buddhist contemplative traditions beyond dogma and scripture. There's a kind of inwardness, which um, I've had the privilege of being with, that I think in these times of dogmatic entitlement um, and citing books and passages really turns our heart and our mind and our, our desire for justice away from the commonality. And that um, I think I, I'm now visualizing there's a picture of His Holiness the Dalai Lama and Thomas Merton. I've seen that, yes. And um, in an age of identity politics and fragmentation, I think that perhaps one of the greatest gifts that we can give ourselves and those whom we work with is what is common. And so, anyway, I just wanted to thank you for that. Thank you. Well, um, speaking of what is common, I have to share this great story from my 10-year-old. We went to uh, D.C. a few years ago to visit uh, the Smithsonian. We went to a place on genetics and we got there and we saw that we have 70% of the same DNA as chickens. And she looks at me and she goes, Daddy, we're more like chickens than we're disliked chickens. I said, honey, that is really lovely. Then we move on and we see that humans are 99.5% of the same DNA and apparently there's more genetic variants in a family of chimpanzees than there is in me and you and a person on the other side of the planet. And so she looks at me and she says, Daddy, we're more like our neighbors and chimpanzees are like their own family members. I said, thank you very much, dear. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I was wondering if we were gonna get any more animals in before the end of the day. <laughs> and you just got two more. And the dog, three more, the yeah. Chickens. Yes. Fantastic. <laughs> Uh, unfortunately, we've run out of time, but that was absolutely fantastic. Thank you uh, to, to all of you. Thank you so much. <laughs>